Welcome back, family. I'm Jason. I'm Pastor Don. And this is the Victory Podcast. Welcome back, Victory family. It is so great to have you with us, and it is Resurrection Weekend, and we're going to talk about it. What it means to us, next to Christmas, this is is our big day, because without a resurrection, we have no Savior. Well, without a resurrection, what we don't have is a guarantee. Exactly. The resurrection is the guarantee that God indeed is Lord even over death itself, which, when you get right down to it, that's the one thing we all, the human race, is the most afraid of, Jason. Yeah. So without Jesus actually coming out of mm-hmm. that tomb, it none of this goes into play. Exactly. Right? We are looking for another savior at that point. Well, at that point in time, yeah, there's no what makes Christianity unique is the certainty of it all. Right. Uh, the no so factor. I mean, other religions promise some things, but only Christianity promises the complete forgiveness of sins, past, present, and future, and guarantees it with a crucified, buried, and yes, indeed, a risen Savior. Exactly right. So let's, we talked a lot about context, mm-hmm. so let's keep this in context. So let's, let's, let's talk about the surroundings around the resurrection. <coughs> okay. Well, what makes the resurrection, we talked last week about how Jesus came down the Mount of Olives, the palm branches, all of this we commonly call the triumphal entry. Mm -hmm. Well, understand that at that point in time, the masses and even the disciples, I suppose, to, to, to a degree, are not thinking in terms of a savior for their soul. Right. They're thinking in terms of a savior for their nation. They think that Jesus is coming down the Mount of Olives and entering in Jerusalem, proclaiming himself to be the rightful heir to the throne of David, which he was and is. But their thinking is, well, you know what? If he could do all these miracles we've seen and heard about, and if he could raise the dead, many of them heard or seen him, seen that incident too. If he could do all of that, then surely he can deliver us from the Romans as well. And we can have our nation back and be powerful and all of these expectations, except they miss the part that that wasn't what he was coming for the first time. No, no. And, and you know, it was a big celebration at the beginning, mm-hmm. like we talked about Oh, last sure. Week, you know, and then when it came time, I, I want to get your thoughts on something here real mm-hmm. quick. It says, Jesus set apart the week before his crucifixion to remind his disciples that the death would that death wouldn't win and mm-hmm. his kingdom would never end. Now when he talks about his kingdom, right. Right. He's not talking about the kingdom of Israel or or the kingdom of Jerusalem or or being under persecution from mm-hmm. Pharaoh or the Romans or, or anything like that. He is talking about a heavenly kingdom. Yes. In fact, if you go to the crucifixion story where he has that conversation with Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, mm-hmm. Um, He tells Pilate, Pilate asks him, are you a king then? And he says, you said it, but my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus made it very clear that what he was coming to establish the first time was a spiritual kingdom. That is, God was going to come live in the hearts of redeemed sinners like you and like me. Right. That's what he was coming for. Now, he will come again the second time and set up a physical, literal, earthly kingdom. As Christians, that's what we're waiting on now. So so in this week leading up to this mm-hmm. very important resurrection, do you, do you think the people realized that or they understood that he wasn't so much? He, what he was really trying to tell them is, is I love you and goodbye. Mm-hmm. Yep. No, I don't even think the disciples understood that. I really don't. Um, When you get right down to it, he tried to tell them. (laughs) You know, he tried his best to tell them, look, three days, I'm going to be in the ground. I'm going to be betrayed in the hands of sinful men. Remember, he told that to Peter, and Peter gets in his face quite literally and says, Lord, be it far from you. That's never going to happen. If I have to die for you to keep it from happening, even Peter didn't understand right. that that was going to be the case. And he very distinctly told them three days later, I am going to walk out of that grave alive. And for whatever reason, they couldn't get it. They couldn't grasp it. It was after the resurrection 
that they finally figured it all out and put it together. And I, and I think resurrection <laughs> really means God's not done. Oh. Jesus is not finished. What resurrection means is we're just getting started yeah. at that point. That the best part is still yet to come. And there's every reason to be hopeful. So why jump through all the hoops? Why go through everything he went through? Well, you understand that, as I mentioned a minute ago, Christianity as a faith is unique in a lot of ways. Well, one of those ways is, like I said, the certainty of it all. And the, the, the idea, no other world religion, not Islam, pick it, I don't care. No other world religion claims such a phenomenal, amazing, I guess to a lost person crazy idea as death could not hold our leader. Well, and I, I think something funny to, to, to kind of point out mm -hmm. to people is, is all these other world religions, all these major world religions, Judaism, Islam, uh, things like that, they all acknowledge Jesus. Yes, they do. So, so you want to say Christianity specifically has this, this Jesus thing and this, that, and mm -hmm. you know, Islam, the Quran mentions Jesus. Now yes. they believed he was a prophet. Yeah, that's right. But you know, they don't, that's the Jesus common thing. Remember it says, and, Eve, we talked about the triumphal entry right. and what they say, blessed is the prophet that comes in the name of the Lord. Even the Jews of his day were more than happy to acknowledge Jesus as a prophet of God. Right. But we know, okay, sure. He was that, but he was so, so much more. The thing is, Jason, if you can disprove the resurrection and it's been tried, if you can disprove the resurrection, what you do is you take Christianity from its unique position to being just another religion. Right. So what are, what are some common objections <laughs> then to the resurrection of Jesus? Well, it, I mean, it makes logical sense. You, you read the Bible and it, mm -hmm. we've talked plenty of times. It, it takes more faith to believe that, that the world around us just happened. Mm-hmm than to believe the Bible. Um, and, and when you really study the Bible and you start to look at the Bible and, and see how, what is it, 44 authors, 60-some books? Mm -hmm. 66 books and they written all by 44 different theme. authors, yes. And they they're all, all the same theme, absolutely. written over decades. These people didn't even know each other. Actually written over 1,400 years apart, if you go from Revelation to all the way back to the book of Genesis. Yes. These people had no way of knowing no. each other. No. It takes more faith to believe that tree outside grows out of the ground than this stuff. So, so sure. what are the objections that people have? Well, remember, before we get into them, the whole point is it, it's kind of like evolution in a way, Jason. Yeah. It doesn't have to make sense. You just have to come up with something to explain away the obvious, you know? Um, and it's this. Well, some believe that Jesus didn't really die on the cross. The 18th century German rationalist started this idea except it's really not rational when you get right down to it. They said that Christ never actually died. He passed out on the cross, and those poor, barbaric, stupid Roman soldiers couldn't tell the difference. Now, let me remind everybody before I finish this thought and go on, let me remind you that these were soldiers who literally crucified people for a living. That was their job. Yeah, there are times when history says that they crucified so many people at a time that they ran out of crosses to put them all on. They had to wait for more trees to grow. Yeah, they kind of had, they kind of knew what they were doing. So, you know, that makes no sense to me. The, and even his own disciples mistook it, you know, that three days later, he was just the cool, damp air of the tomb had him feeling so much better. Well, now, hold on time out a minute let's apply a little common sense here the bible is clear that Pilate was terrified the jews were terrified of an empty tomb make they make that crystal clear they want to put a seal on the tomb they roll that huge stone in front of it in any injured man if he was yes. that injured enough to pass out from his yes. injuries now bear you're not rolling yeah, that stone bear in mind by this time they've pierced his head with the crown of thorn they've laid his back in ribbons with the roman cat and nine tails and Didn't now they they've crucified a spear into him oh absolutely they 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 pierced his hands and feet and just to make sure he was dead because heaven forbid he should still be on the cross alive when a religious holiday hit oh yeah they stuck a spear and the bible says out came blood and water well the only way that's even possible jason is if they pierced the pericardial sac that surrounds Around the, the heart. heart yeah jesus was dead he was he did not swoon and 
just playing devil's advocate for a minute, well, hallelujah, if that's the case, then a man in that kind of physical condition managed all by himself to roll that stone away. Oh, by the way, the Bible says just after that, he took a seven-mile walk with a couple of disciples on, on the Emmaus Road. Mm -hmm. After all that blood loss, after all those wounds to his hands and feet, after a spear piercing his side, then... That just doesn't make good sense at all. So the swoon theory is nonsense. There's the theft theory. Well, that's what's presented in the Bible in Matthew 28 when they paid the guards right. to say he didn't. Well, now, think about this for a minute, folks. Under Roman law, there was a simple system. You see it also in Acts 16 when that Philippian jailer is about to kill himself because he thinks all the prisoners have gone. Yeah. Well, the reason for that was he would rather kill his own self than undergo what the Romans were about to do to him. Because if you lost a prisoner, you paid for their life with your life. Yeah, it, this is not rocket science. This is not complicated. Oh, by the way, we think of one or two guards. There may have been as many as 60 to 120 soldiers stationed at that tomb just so the disciples couldn't get to the body. Right. Then, so swooning, no. Theft, no, the disciples weren't that skilled. Right. My personal favorite, Jason, Not is what to go against the Roman army. Itself. Exactly. These are these are fishermen and a tax collector. And yeah. no, my personal favorite is the hallucination theory. There are those who have proposed the notion that they, they the, just imagined it. Well, the, the stress got to them. See, <laughs> the stress of the, the stress of everything they had gone through or and this is my personal favorite part. Some have supposed that they were the victims of mass hypnosis. <laughs> the problem is, if you read the 24th chapter and the 39th verse of Luke, uh, he invited him, said, come feel me, touch me. Yeah. It, it, see, I'm not a ghost. He's people saw him. The Bible says, in fact, he appeared at one point in time to more than 500 believers at one time. Yeah. Now, so he didn't swoon. They didn't steal the body. No, there was no mass hallucination. There was no mass hypnosis. And then the dumbest of all, one liberal theologian named Kearsop Lake actually proposed that those poor, dumb, stressed out disciples, Jason, accidentally went to the wrong tomb. And when that gardener, you know, that was really Jesus, yeah. said he is not here, he was really saying, he wasn't saying he was resurrected. He was saying, dude, wrong tomb. No. He's over there next door. Come no. on, really? No. And and they kind of spell it out in Mark 15, don't they? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. It's saying, you know, says the two Marys, we are watching closely. Mm hmm at the burial and know exactly where he is exactly laid. and then they go and tell the disciples peter and john run to the tomb and it says when they went inside they saw this napkin the face cloth that had been around jesus dead body and it's cool it's a little tidbit of just joy and hope you get in there because it talks about how it was tied together in a certain way well mm -hmm. i think they had seen the exact same thing just a few hours earlier when Jesus took his napkin at the Last Supper, I think Jesus left them a little clue. Yeah. See? Yeah. So, no, it wasn't the wrong tomb. The, the, the obvious answer, the simplest answer, is still the right answer. He did not swoon. They did not steal the body. There was no mass hypnosis. No, they didn't accidentally go to the wrong tomb. Jesus walked out of that tomb alive, and he still is today. And, and it's so... You've you've been around me long enough. I've, mm -hmm. I've been married to your daughter going on eleven years in right. November. You've been around me long enough to know that I'm a I'm a common sense guy. Yep. I tell people all and the time, sometimes a bit of a cynic. Use your common sense, right? Right. None of these four points have <laughs> any common sense no. to them. No. You're gonna you're gonna mass hypnotize up to five hundred Roman guards without mm -hmm. somebody going, hey, by the way, you're trying to do something sketchy. Exactly. Right. You don't exactly. think that the Roman army knows exactly where they put that body. You're out of your mind. Well, again, yeah, these are professionals. Yeah. This is what they did for a living. Yeah. And no, friends and neighbors, they were not barbaric. And as high profile fools. as this was. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, sure. You, you know, it's like, all right, listen, if we lose this dude, 
Mm -hmm. We're done. Oh, yeah, because the chief priests were just absolutely vehement, and they pressured and almost tormented poor old Pontius Pilate. You know, my problem with Pilate was he's a coward, but he was not a fool. No. And they tormented that poor man to make sure that he, he went over and beyond anything he would have done for any other prisoner to make sure that exactly what happened could not happen. Exactly. All right, so I've, I've picked mm -hmm. on those people that want to come up with the, yep. the empty tomb theory. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's, let's prove it. How are okay. we so sure of something that happened 2,000 years well, ago? Well, we, we have the testimony of all those disciples. And again, people like to suppose that these people 2,000 years ago were complete fools, barbarians, glorified cavemen. We've got a lot of things yeah. from them today. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah, except that we still the, yeah. use. They so, were none of the above. No. Um, if we had lived in the first century and taken the time to look, you'd have seen tears in their eyes at the crucifixion. They were destroyed. This was their hope hanging on that cross. Yeah. Um, we understand this. What they had worked for, prayed for, traveled for, had died. Now, if Jesus doesn't come back from the dead, Matthew would have gone back to being a tax collector. Peter would have gone back to being a fisherman, as would his brother Andrew and James and John. But they didn't. They spent the rest of their lives preaching this now this new good news. Everywhere they went, someone asked me this last Sunday, actually, mm -hmm. Wednesday night, excuse Wednesday me. Wednesday night, yeah. Yeah, about this exact thing. What happened to the disciples? What happened to the apostles? And history very clearly records that all of them except for the apostle John, and that's another story in and of itself, but they all went out and spent the rest of their lives, and every last one of them died as a martyr for the cause. That testimony just screams... Wouldn't you think one of them would have cracked, <laughs> you know? Yeah. If Jesus would have remained dead, somebody would have done, somebody somewhere along the way would have gone back. They would have backtracked on their faith, but none of them did. Yeah. And, and I want to point out something to everybody, and we talk a lot about salvation. We just talked about one of, of Jesus' closest friends, mm -hmm. let's say, was a tax collector. Exactly. This is, I'm gonna make it a little tongue in cheek here. This is tax season, right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're we're in April, right? This is tax season. Your taxes are coming due. I understand this year is a little different, but normally, right? If God can forgive the tax collector, He can forgive you too. That being said, there is so much evidence. There is so much need for the resurrection that this man did this for us. Mm -hmm. This perfect son of God suffered this for us. Right. So that we could meet his father. Exactly. And that is our message. That is that is what we stand on. Everything else flows out of that. Now, no, don't get me wrong. We're we're fired up today. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm I'm excited. Well, this Re is our big day. Resurrection Resurrection Sunday, which is tomorrow, mm -hmm. is a big day for Christians, right? It's it's what we put a lot on. Without the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is no Christianity. Right. Right. Well, and and we 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 call it the Victory Podcast. We're we're members at Victory Baptist Church, and without the resurrection. That word shouldn't even be in our vocabulary. Yeah, there's no victory. There's no, no victory over the grave. There would be no. no name on this church. Nope. Well, there'd be no church. There'd be no church, yeah. That's true. We'd be Jewish or... Whatever, you know, something else. Something else. But, um, Pastor Don, g mm -hmm. give us your final thoughts on this. All right. Here's the thing you've got to deal with. Peter was crucified, according to church history, upside down on a cross because he didn't feel himself worthy to die like his Lord and Savior had died. So now think about that. James was run through with a sword. Bartholomew was hacked in pieces. Paul had his head chopped off outside Rome. Stephen was stoned to death. The only one who died of old age was John. Mm -hmm. And church history says a Roman emperor named Diocletian tried to kill him. Boiled him in oil, they say. But having said that, John hadn't written Revelation yet, so he couldn't die. There's a thought there that we'll have to chase around sometime, too. <laughs> You're a a, Mar roll. Well, Martin Luther said, I'm immortal until God's finished with me. Right. 
Right. That's it. You've got to deal with the fact that according to 1 Corinthians 15, 6, above 500 brethren saw Jesus alive after he was supposedly dead. 500 people. That's a whole lot. And you have to deal with the credibility of these witnesses who never one time flinched. And you have to deal with the part that it's not like it's not for lack of trying. In the first century, the chief priest wanted to disprove it. You know Pilate did because he didn't want this on his record. And throughout history, there's one, the name General Lew Wallace may ring with a lot of people and you may not know why. Mm -hmm. But it's because in your high school literature class, you probably had to read a book called Ben-Hur. Well, the backstory is Lou Wallace was an out-and-out -out agnostic to the point of almost being an atheist who went to the Holy Land to once and for all disprove the resurrection of Jesus and end this Christian nonsense. Okay. Yeah, in his travels, there was only one problem. He discovered as he went along, just like the disciples before him, mm -hmm. he couldn't disprove it. Ben-Hur is actually his testimony and allegory to what he discovered that Jesus is alive and he became a follower of Jesus Christ along the way. And story after story like that of people who started out as agnostic, started out as unbeliever until, and this is what I challenge you to do, friend, read the facts. Check out the evidence. Don't believe what you heard somebody who heard it from someone else who got it from some liberal theologian or college professor. Check it out for yourself. And deal Make your own decision. That's right. Deal with the part where the skeptics have come and come and come and gone and gone and gone. And they've never one time successfully proven. All you got to do is find the body. Nobody's ever done it. You've got to deal with the fact that you have a phenomenal growth in the first three centuries of Christianity. You just do. Right. And the truth is, when you're all said and done, here's what's going to happen if you're honest, if you keep an open mind about this thing. You're going to come to the unmistakable conclusion that apparently God must love you so much that yes, indeed, as we celebrated Christmas, his son came into this world born of a virgin so that he could be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, lived a perfect sinless life, and for his trouble got betrayed by sinful men, hung on a cross, but it, remember, they thought they were doing that they were doing God's business yeah. because it pleased the father to bruise him. He had put him to grief. Isaiah 53 says mm -hmm. he who knew no sin had to become sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's God's promise to you today, friend, where you stand, where you sit right now. If you will open your mind to the reality that Jesus Christ died for you, just like he died for me and your father sent him to do it. That's right. It doesn't matter what you've done, what you think you've done. He died for that. And better still, three days later, he walked out of the grave. And there's a wonderful picture in Revelation chapter number one. Jesus says, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, and he says, I have the keys of hell and of death. See, when Jesus walked out of that tomb, friend, he not only walked out alive, he went right past the main gate. And picked up the keys when he left. And the devil couldn't do a single thing about it. Your promise is, if you'll say, Jesus, I am a sinner and I sure need you. I believe, your, I believe the good news. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose from the dead. The Bible says you will, will, will be saved. Not hopefully, will be. Now remember, we're not saying chocolate Easter bunnies aren't tasty. Nope, but love like them. we say at Christmas, remember the reason for this Exactly. Season. Pastor Don, close us in prayer. I will. Father in heaven, thank you. <laughs> what an amazing truth this is. What an amazing thing we get to celebrate tomorrow. And Lord, in reality, every first day of the week when we meet together, but especially tomorrow when we get to celebrate our risen Savior. Yes, Lord. That it was not possible that death should hold you. I pray for some soul today who needs Jesus, that they'll come to you and they'll find the hope and the help they need. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Victory family, until the next time, remember to like and share this video. If you'd like to support this ministry, visit Victory Indy. 
www.ghostsandmysteries.org, and we can't wait to see you on Sunday. Until then, have a blessed day.